So, und jetzt haben wir noch zum Abschluss unserer Female Photo Days den letzten Vortrag von Alina Rudia von Nikon. Der Vortrag wird ebenfalls in, äh, auf Englisch stattfinden und genau, ich gebe jetzt das Wort ab an Alina. Hi guys, uh, my name is Alina Rudia, as probably a lot of you know and as I was just introduced. Uh, I'm really happy to be here in the studio of Photo Meyer in Berlin and this is basically the end of our female photo days. We've had amazing two days and one evening uh, filled with an exhibition opening, a workshops, photo walks, amazing talks by our female photographers and lecturers. Uh, I have to admit, uh, I've, I've co-organized this together with Photomai and Bell Collective, uh, so this was a really, really great event to organize, but I was a little bit worried because, you know, every time you have something so important and it's basically your baby, um, you're really nervous how it would work. And I have to tell you that it worked really, really well. And I really hope that we will do more photo days in the future, female photo days in the future. Um, today, uh, I will uh, talk to you about light, uh, natural, using of natural light in portrait photography. This is something we also already talked uh, about with some of the participants of my photo walks today and yesterday. This is basically my favorite topic, uh, natural light in portrait photography especially, because this is what I basically specialize in. Uh, for a really long time, I photographed travel and now I do more lifestyle, but I always incorporate people in my photography. And I think that without people in photos, uh, that the photos are a little bit empty. This is why I really, really love to photograph people, uh, whether it's a commercial shoot or a uh, personal, personal shoot of mine. I've published a few books. Uh, one is uh, Pripyat Mon Amour, which I filled with, uh, which is basically portrait photos. And so I uh, use only natural light in my photography, uh, in my portrait photography most of the time. So this is what I'm gonna talk to you about uh, today. And well, let's start with the presentation. So yeah, again, the introduction, if you just forgot what I've just said. <laughs> so we're talking about natural light and portrait photography. And here's a picture of myself in a studio, not in natural light. And you can see the compare, uh, compare the presentation to me and see what good lightning actually does to people. <laughs> but um, let's talk a li little bit about me for those who don't know and who probably doubt my expertise. Um, I've studied uh, visual, co uh, visual communication at the University of Arts in Berlin um, and I've studied photography in Letterverein School in Berlin as well, which is actually situated just a few hundred meters, I think it's even less than that, uh, from our studio we're filming today. And I've also studied in Parsons uh, School of Design in New York. Um, I've authored a few books. Um, one uh, is Bell Collective, uh, which is a collection of uh, beautiful uh, female photographers who are doing travel from different perspectives. Uh, we, it came out a few years ago and I cannot recommend it enough. You can buy it on Amazon still and I'm really, really proud because I curated it and the photography in this book is just amazing. Um, as I already said, I'm a founder of Bell Collective. It's a collective of, uh, of photographers, uh, female photographers and, and creators. And we have some exciting news for our collective coming up um, soon. So if you follow us, then you will definitely know what's happening next. If you're not following, please go to Instagram and check it out. Um, I've won a few awards for my photography, won a Smithsonian Photo Award, I've also been an Android Photographer of the Year. I mean, I, I don't brag about it, I just want to tell you that from my personal, um, my personal experience, you don't win if you don't participate and that's a mistake I've made for a really long time in my studies and during my career. I never participated in any contest because I never thought that, you know, it's something I could win. But at the same time, when I started participating, I started winning. <laughs> it means that basically if 
if you don't participate in any contest, then 100% you won't win anything. But the chance really goes up if you actually start sh sending your pictures to contests, start thinking about uh, the topics you're sending. Basically, um, this is a really great um, image booster for you as well as uh, it really helps you to, to feel proud about your work, especially if you get some prize. We've had a little contest here uh, during the female photo days, uh, a woman with a camera. We've got amazing pictures sent to us. We've had a really amazing exhibition, which was uh, of our finalists as well as of the people who, um, of, the, uh, of the winners uh, who got awesome prizes from our partner, Nikon. Nikon Dach and also from other sponsors. So um, yeah, you can see that, um, I mean, you can see it still in Berlin, the exhibition, but I have to admit that I, it was also something I was really, really uh, happy to, to do and to organize. This contest really uh, made me uh, feel like a part of a community of this awesome women who participated and all those amazing pictures they, they sent to us. Uh, they really inspired me to, to maybe even experiment more in my own photography. I've been working with Nikon already for almost four years and um, this is where I'm... Um, uh, I, I really uh, photograph always on my travels and uh, my commercial and private projects always with Nikon camera. Recently I've uh, changed to a um, system camera so I don't do DCLR anymore just because um, the quality is the same but it's much more lightweight. I have a camera with me here. I don't think I, uh, you see me. Do they see me? Do people see me? I think it would be nice if people see me right now because I'm talking so much. Um, yeah, and uh, I have a, yeah, so I, I photograph with the Nikon uh, Z or Z, depends on the country you're coming from, seven. It's, and uh, for, for um, portrait photography, I use 50 millimeter quite a lot. So this is a, a lens I was shooting during the female photo days. Uh, for these two days, I was shooting only with a 50 millimeter because we we're doing a lot of portrait photography. I will actually talk about different lenses in my presentation. So before I talk about light, I will talk about the lenses uh, which are best for portrait photography. And I will talk about lenses which, uh, which you can use for different types of shots in portrait photography. So the, let's uh, talk about the contents of my presentation. Uh, so I would uh, talk about lenses first, then I would go in different types of natural lights. So you can, for example, differentiate uh, different light, light situations according to times of a day, then according to light direction and um, specific, uh, and then I would discuss the specific lighting situations. Um, and uh, then we will also go into creating certain mood with natural light, like what light is best to create a particular mood, a particular, I, to maybe um, focus more on a person or tell a story. Uh, and we will discuss this a little bit. And then I will go into yeah, camera settings for different lighting situations as well. Um, first, as I've promised, we will talk about lenses for portrait photography. The, uh, one of the lenses you can use is the wide angle lens. I know that most people think that, you know, portrait lenses are those like 50 millimeter or 85 millimeter, but you can also uh, do a full body portrait, of course, and the wide angle lens like a 24 millimeter is um, also possible for portraits. You have to understand that the wide angle lenses have more distor perspective distortion, especially if you come really close to a person. That means if you would do a portrait with a wide angle, uh, their nose, which is the nearest to the camera, would look super huge. And then the, um, their, um, yeah, the, the, the features and the body parts which are further away from the camera would look actually uh, smaller. Then um, this kind of lens is optimal for food, full body shots and also you can show a lot of environment when shooting with this lens 
and it can be used both indoors and outdoors because you don't need such a huge, a huge space between a person and a camera. It also can be used in like situations where there's not enough space between a photographer and um, the person uh, you, you basically a photographer is photographing. Then you have an all-rounder lens, which uh, is used a lot by uh, reportage and documentary photographers. If you would go for a prime lens with which you can shoot in most situations, outdoors and uh, a reportage, like if you want to shoot a reportage, maybe a travel photo and you have only one prime lens, then you would definitely, um, uh, then you will definitely can use a 35 millimeter um, because uh, this is a a lens which offers less perspective distortion and it is close to human eye. So very close. Uh, there's always an argument whether it's a 35 millimeter or a 50 millimeter, which is the closest to human eye. It shows more surroundings. Uh, background becomes part of the story. So if you want to show a little bit more of a background, for example, if you're traveling, if you want to do a portrait, but at the same time you want to show the environment, you should use a 35 millimeter. At the same time, uh, yeah, it's um, ver more versatile than 50 or millimeter, for example, in composition, and it's more flexible when shooting in tight spaces. That means that you can still have like a narrow street or maybe a small room and still have that distance between a person and your camera. You have uh, less bouquet than with those, um, the, 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 with those prime lenses with um, um, uh, like 85 or 105 and the background is not as separated from foreground uh, as in 85 millimeter, for example. But generally, if you want to show both person and environment, this is a great lens. I've used it a lot. I actually, this was my to-go lens when I was shooting portraits, when I was traveling, because I always wanted to show not just the person, but also the place I'm shooting the person at. So here's, for example, a picture I've shot in the Chernobyl uh, exclusion zone. And this was important for me not only to show this woman uh, who lives there in the Chernobyl ex exclusion zone in the um, uh, abandoned village there, but I also wanted to show the environment she's in, this old house that she is using to store her vegetables and fruits. And this is why I chose the 35, because I actually managed to not only show the woman, but also basically set up a scene. It, and I really, really love the picture. It's one of my favorite from uh, the Chernobyl uh, area where I've actually shot quite a lot. Here's another uh, example of using a 35 millimeter for a full body portrait, but also with environment. This one I've shot in New York. It is a friend of mine, she's a model, but at the same time, it was a spontaneous shoot. We were just walking around uh, Chelsea district in New York and I saw this amazing orange wall and I love colors. So I just decided to shoot it with 35 millimeter. And you can see that the colors here are popping and you have this kind of feeling of the place, you know that we're in an urban environment and yeah, it, it worked really well. Here's another, a little bit close up shot with a 35 millimeter. Again, I was, uh, I wanted to show a model in a minimalistic environment, but uh, I also used this kind of bouquet in the foreground in order to frame her. Then we go switch to the 50 millimeter lens. It's the closest to what human eye sees. A lot of photographers and uh, argue there is almost no distortion. I think it's basically uh, you get the features uh, the way they are. Um, it's a little bit more bouquet. It's more bouquet and background blur than 35 millimeter, especially if you have a very open aperture aperture of like 1.4, some 50 millimeters have uh, 1.2 um, aperture, the, 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 big, the biggest aperture. But um, I have to just uh, mention that if you're choosing a portrait lens and you don't have a lot of budget for it, or if you're just choosing a lens which would deliver really good uh, 
photos and really great quality for really low cost. Uh, then 50mm 1.8 is the best lens basically from any uh, kind of company like you know I'm using the Nikon Nikon 50mm uh, 1.8 and the quality is amazing. I uh, really love that lens. It's really an all-rounder for me for portraits. I mean, I also do reportage and documentary with it. And you don't pay more than, I think, like 120, 150 euros for a 50 millimeter 1.8 lens. These are the pictures I did with the lens. As you can see, it's great for portraits. And I used it for both minimalistic background and also setting up a model in a environment. Both of these pictures are uh, shot in flat light, uh, so uh, not much shadow play here. So I played with colors and with a color contrast here. Um, and uh, last but not least is the telephoto lenses, which you can use for the portrait photography. I personally own the 85 millimeter uh, lens. Uh, this picture, uh, which you see here, is actually used. Uh, uh, I shot it using 85 millimeter. You can see that I'm concentrated on the model while the background is really nicely blurred. So uh, with 85 millimeter and even more so with like 135 millimeter, there's also a 105 millimeter lens. You get a very shallow depth of field, excellent background and foreground separation. Um, you have extremely compressed images where background appears much closer to the foreground. You have a beautiful bouquet for, and you, so you can really put like a focus on a person and then the background is really nice, nicely um, separated. And it's ideal for close-ups and works out best outdoors uh, where you have a lot of space between a model and y yourself as well as from background because uh, since the uh, distance is relatively like with 135 millimeters is you have to be really far away from a model in order to show a little bit of the environment. So this is another picture I did with 85 millimeter in Japan. Okay. Basically, I know that you're here all for the natural light in photography, but I wanted to mention the lenses because since we're talking about portrait photography, it's important to understand that basically you can use any lens for portraits. It just depends what kind of lenses work best for which kind of photos, portrait photos. And I know that traditionally a lot of people think that portrait meaning like just showing the face or maybe just showing the like half body. But basically portrait is a depiction of a person and you can also shoot portraits which are a little bit further away with an environment around and for that you can use a wide angle for example. So um, I've separated um, into uh, first basically part of uh, different light situations is by time of the day. So uh, we, I will be talking about dusk or blue hour, then golden hour, which is usually happening around sunset and sunrise, a little bit before that, and also hard light, uh, which is usually sometimes like midday sun, which is the hardest light to photograph portraits in. But I will talk about that because sometimes you just don't have an opportunity to pick a light situation. When you're traveling and you only go to a place and you're there for a short period of time and you want to shoot portraits and the light is not optimal but at the same time you need to do a shoot like you either need or you want to do a really good shot there are a few tricks you can use in order to shoot in really hard light so let's start with dusk uh, or blue hour so blue hour refers to a period of about like 20 40 minutes it's a rather short period of time uh, within the evening or morning twilight and usually during this time the sun is already far below the horizon so you don't have the redness in the sky but at the same time you don't have the sky pitch black you still have this blue color and um, the, the only the blue light spectrum is still dominating the sky and um, yeah it's still not dark enough uh, to be like it's not night yet but it's very very nice I usually like love dusk also for like urban photography uh, because usually you have the, the street lights are already on 
and you can already have the, the kind of like night shot but still shot during where you have still the blue in the sky without it having like super big contrast with the lights of the streets but uh, when we're shooting during dusk uh, people like when we're shooting people when we're shooting porters during that dusk then um, it's a good time for a little bit like dramatic melancholic pictures you have to also not forget that during dusk you don't have enough light so if you have a really camera with a, a you know, aperture which can go really open to 1.8 1.4 this is the way to do it you either open the aperture completely open or you're using a tripod at the same time for portraits a tripod is still hard because a person might be moving so I would recommend using an, a little bit higher ISO and uh, open your, uh, your aperture and of course the shutter speed would be a little bit uh, lower, uh, slower. So yeah, in order to avoid shaky images, go up with an ISO a little bit and open the aperture and try to not shake too much and you will get your dramatic and melancholic picture. <laughs> mm, then, of course, a lot of photographers, I'm pretty sure most of you know that golden hour is probably the best time for a lot of portrait picture situation, especially if you are doing live stories or wedding shots or something a little bit more romantic. Um, then golden hour is a perfect time for it because uh, it, it's a time approximately one, two hours after sunrise and three, four hours before sunset. At this time, the sun is not too high over the horizon, so you don't have really strong shadows like uh, during the noon. Um, and also the light is not as strong, so you really don't have that huge contrast between the light and the uh, dark parts. And um, it is perfect for all kinds of creative pictures, um, emotional portraits, especially if you're using backlight, which I will talk a, a little bit later. So uh, yeah, this light is uh, warmer and softer. It allows you to create dreamy portraits with bo both back and front lighting. So in this, in this example, I'm showing you one shot is done with a front lighting and you can see that it's more crisp because there is no light falling onto the lens and the the that's the picture on the left the picture on the right is one of my absolute favorite portrait pictures probably of my friend helen um, who also participated in as a as a uh, she also gave a photo walks uh, on our female photo days she's an amazing photographer and we were traveling together to namibia and as you can see this is a backlit situation also with a bit of rim light i will talk about those kind of lights a little bit later but you can see that i also you, you can see the beautiful bouquet um, and the, these are sprinklers water sprinklers uh, in front of her and also behind her and she's standing in the middle and me focusing on her with an open aperture created this kind of beautiful bouquet of little like dots in front uh, in the big in the in front and also in the back uh, behind her um, so let's talk about hard light which is basically the hardest hardest um, light to photograph and a lot of I would I would suggest for most people to if you're especially if you're a beginner to maybe avoid uh, hard light situations because a lot of people don't know how to work with it and um, it causes a severe glare and it's also unfavorable dark hollows under the eyes and uh, when I was a student I sometimes uh, photographed um, weddings and during the weddings uh, usually you don't have a choice when to photograph people and they would ask me to photograph a huge group of people during midday outside um, you can't really control 100 people from a wedding you can't really tell everyone to look to be in the shadow or to look up everybody always and if you don't have special extra lighting or reflectors for 100 people then you end up with like people having huge hollows under their eyes because the sun is uh, because the sun is falling directly from above and then your eyebrows are 
casting shadow under your eye. Your nose is casting shadow under your nose and you have like a Hitler mustache, <laughs> which nobody wants. Mm. And so you have to really work with the position of the model in order to uh, avoid that kind of shadows which are unfavorable. You always can use shadows in a creative way, but if you're just shooting a person frontally, it usually won't look creative. It just would look like a, like a mistake. So I would, if you absolutely need to shoot during midday, you have to avoid direct sunlight and look for open shade, which I will talk about later. And also use minimalistic backgrounds to avoid extra shadows. Because if you, for example, in this picture on the, uh, which I'm showing here, I photograph also a little bit from below. So I was, uh, and I also framed uh, my friend in a way that, you know, the, the building she was, photo uh, she was standing at, it was lit from above completely. And she basically has also some shadows from her nose and also under her, Mm, under her sunglasses but it was the position of her face is still a little bit more uh, towards the sun so she doesn't have such huge shadows distracting shadows um, if you try to position the model in profile facing the sun and let her, her or him look a little bit up you can avoid those shadows under the nose and eyebrows eye, eyebrows since of course um, the the face the nose is facing like the direction of the sun so the picture on the right uh, is uh, a picture I shot on Cyprus and the model as you can see is looking to to uh, well she doesn't she, she looks to the right and uh, in this way we don't have the shadows but at the same time you're not very flexible with the with the pictures you you're getting because uh, in this way you can only really photograph people in profile in order to avoid the shadows and as you can see on the picture of the left as well the model is a little bit further away i wanted to show the architecture this is beautiful murala, uh, murala roja uh, in in calpa spain by the marvelous really talented architect uh, ricardo bofil I think uh, this is an amazing uh, building. It's a, it was a really, a really great opportunity to shoot there. And as you can see, my friend is looking up in order to not have those kind of shadow under her chin. You have them still a little bit, but this kind of shadow she's having is like basically underlining her jawline instead of casting a huge shadow on her neck. Uh, hard light uh, is sometimes also bad for really overlit surfaces. So in this example, you can use and work with multiple layers to divert um, attention of a viewer from the overlit elements. For example, if you're shooting in a location with a lot of negative space, uh, negative space meaning a lot of empty surface, which is overlit, um, like in the situation of my, me shooting my friend in this photocabine in, Germ in Berlin, uh, the part which is on the left of the picture is quite overlit, it's white or silver even. So um, in order to distract the viewer and also uh, minimize the negative space and that white uh, surface, I use the um, greenery in the foreground in order to frame her in a way and also reduce the negative space dominance. And that really, really worked well. I mean, I really love using layering in my pictures in order to generally frame people and also create depth. And in this case, also to minimize the negative space, as I already said. Okay, so now that we are went uh, through the times of day when you're shooting different kinds of pictures and what kind of uh, pictures you can shoot during the different types of day. I'll talk a little bit about the light direction. It might sound very easy because of course you can, you can shoot from front, from back, from side, but there are different uh, also rules on how to shoot it and there are a lot of tricks on how to make different type of lighting back, uh, easy, like look good and look professional. So the frontal light is usually called key light. It's, uh, then you have backlight and as well as rim light, which is a, like a backlight with a little 
basically lighting just a contour of a person of an, or of an object and also you have the side light and split light. When it comes to key lights and frontal light, the purpose of this lighting is to eliminate the main features of the subject or object, in our case of a model or of a person you photograph. This frontal light uh, means that the uh, light is in front of a model, that means that it's behind the camera. And this is the um, least dramatic of all lights probably because you're basically illuminating the, the face from front um, and it really well suited for comp cards, for business portraits, fashion and reportage. If you're really lighting the person from the front, especially like it's an even light, then it also minimizes the, uh, minimizes the uh, you know, wrinkles and uh, minimizes blemishes because these blemishes and wrinkles are really filled with light and there's no shadows. So it's really, really like, it, it's really um, complementing the, the, skin, the skin of a model or of a person you're photographing. When, it's, uh, when we're talking about backlight, then obviously we're uh, talking about a person being lit from the back. Backlight is a little bit tricky to photograph because, uh, well, um, you, need, you, you have to use the manual, mo manual mode of your camera most of the time. Um, backlight pictures are really great for emotional portraits, weddings, lifestyle photos and love story reportages because it creates this kind of dreamy, beautiful, soft look. Let me just drink a little bit of water because the more I talk, <clears throat> the more I sound like Marge Simpson. <laughs> So the first step to, uh, uh, to taking a backlit photo would be switching a camera into a manual mode because uh, cameras are calibrated for basic front lightning and as a result they have trouble autofocusing or adjusting backlight settings. And uh, the cameras uh, usually either, uh, if you photograph an automatis, a model or a person against the sun, you've often had basically just a black, uh, per, like just a dark uh, silhouette of a person and then really uh, over uh, light sky. This is why you have to go in the manual modus to do this. Here's a little tip on the camera settings. So in order to take a good backlit photo, you have uh, to slightly overexpose the image since the front of your subject is usually uh, darker than the um, immediate area than the the background because obviously the sky is in the back uh, the sun is in the back so that means that the, the the face is not lit but the background is so you need to overlight overlit overlight the, the the person's face um, to the best uh, to photograph uh, is uh, to use the open aperture uh, 1.4 or 2.8. Uh, with an open aperture you get an optimal background and foreground separation. The bouquet also works and you, you also keep enough light on the face of your model in this case. And you also don't really need a reflector but of course a lot of photographers also love to use a reflector during their backlight, backlit sessions because in this way you really light also light up the face of the model even more. In the case of the photo you see here on the left, uh, I didn't use a reflector. This is why we have uh, more of a um, uh, hazy look. Um, so if I would use a reflector, uh, the sun would reflect onto the face of the model and it would be more sharp also because we don't have that kind of haze. For this type of images, I would think that I would, I would recommend a prime lens like 50 millimeter, 85 millimeter or even 135 millimeter because those lenses also um, have the, mo the, the, biggest ap uh, the biggest apertures. So with aperture 1.2 to 1.8, I would use those for, for the pictures. Um, the best backlit photos are taken usually during the um, golden hour, which we already discussed, because as I've already told you, sun is um, already very low uh, at, and it's next to the horizon, so you have a low contrast between the foreground and background. 
the light uh, the, the, the light contrast is really low so you don't really have such an overlit background as you can see in this even though I still had to to a little bit overlight the model's face, the contrast between the background and her face is not that big. We're not losing any kind of information in the sky. You can still see those pixels. It's not completely white and bleached from overexposure, but it's actually having some color in it. I really love using water elements like fountains and lawn sprinkles uh, or raindrops to give my backlit and sidelit images a dreamy look. And also dust uh, works really well for rim light. Uh, talking about rim light, it's basically um, when the backlight hits uh, the model also a little bit from the side, creating this kind of contour, as you can see this like light contour on the front of the face. The rim light is really great for uh, profile pictures, for profile, uh, for shooting a person into profile, because as you can see, we see the, really the, the, silhouette, the, the silhouette of a person really well. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, this, this kind of rim lighting as well as backlighting in this situation with the dust and the dust on the left and with the drops of spring of water on the right, it creates really this kind of dreamy and mysterious almost effect, which uh, can be really nicely used in, um, in your creative and emotional portraits. Okay. Um, now we will talk about, or I will talk and you will listen, <laughs> Um, about uh, side light and side light um, basically is speaks for itself it means that your uh, your object or subject the person the model you're photographing is lit from the side and uh, one uh, sided illumination often it leads to high contrast between the side which is facing the sun or the light and the side which is in the shadow and um, when taking those kind of portraits, uh, the sidelining can also cause the um, cast shadow from the nose, for example. Um, and it's usually perceived, sometimes if it's done not well, it, it can be a little bit annoying uh, when you have like shadows which are not very, um, I mean, you need to really know what you're doing so that you don't have an unwanted uh, shadow which looks like a mistake rather than like as a, as a um, creative choice. And depending on the angle uh, of the uh, light, which is falling either from directly from split light, which is 90 degrees light, and the Rembrandt light, which is 45 degrees. Um, here, for example, there are two pictures in the left. You have basically the split light where the model is shot <clears throat> directly from the side, like the light from the window is falling directly onto her, um, well, from my point of view, from the right, from her point of view on the left. And you can see that, uh, you know, in the room where she was sitting, it was not too dark. She still has some sun or some uh, light reflected onto her chick, cheek, but at the same time still it's like half-half in this case. Uh, in the case on the right, it's my late grandfather. I photographed him like many years ago. This picture is rather old. Here we have an example of, well, maybe not a perfect example, but still of Rembrandt light where you have this kind of triangle here under between the nose and the cheek, like so part of his cheek is lit. Well, uh, because still some light falls onto it from the 45 degrees degree angle. Like what I'm talking to you right now about 45 degrees, 90 degrees, it doesn't have to be particularly, you, you're not, you don't have to measure it with, uh, uh, I don't even know with what kind of, what are you measuring the, the angles, the circular, uh, 
I don't even know what, what is the name of the thing I used back when I was 12 in my math class. I, I really, with my geometry class, I don't remember what it's called anymore. But yeah, you just look at your uh, subject or your model and you decide what kind of angle you want. Do you want uh, this part of the face, for example, if the light is coming from the side, do you want that part of the face completely dark? Do you want really strong contrast? Or maybe you want to use a reflector to light a person a little bit, to reflect a little bit of the light so your picture looks more balanced. I mean, this is really for you to experiment and to decide. Um, so, um, it really, uh, this kind of side lighting, it really emphasizes the contours and surfaces so you can really experiment and see what works, what doesn't work. I mean, with the new digital uh, cameras, I mean, they're not that new anymore, but I mean, with digital cameras, it, now you have an opportunity to shoot so many pictures and if they look bad, then you can always just delete them. So you can just, just experiment with first and not really think about all this technicality so much. Um, you can, yeah, you can shoot in aperture priority mode as well as in manual in this case. Uh, I would, it also depends on your preference. Uh, it's not like in a backlit situation where you really have to control the, the aperture and shutter speed so much. In this case, I think the camera would actually measure the light uh, situation pretty well. Um, yeah, and as I have here, as the last point here, if you want to lighten up the dark side of the face, you should use a reflector or in, as you can see in the left picture, if there's a wall somewhere, especially if you're shooting in the, in the, in the room, if there's a wall which is light enough, then you have a little bit of the light reflected onto the uh, shadowy part of the person so it's not as dark. Now let's move to the specific light, light situations. Um, well, flat light uh, is something I will talk about. Then we'll talk about reflected light. Then I will talk about open shade, which I already mentioned before. Uh, then we will go into the limelight and spotlight. And then window light, which is not a really specific light situation, more of a, a source, but we'll talk about that. And then I'll talk shortly about available uh, artificial light, which you usually see, um, well, at night on the streets but you can still use that kind of available light using the same principles you use the natural lights uh, for. So talking about flat light. Flat light is the light that creates little or no play of light and shadow in the scene. Um, you get the light, um, this kind of flat light, in, um, direct, uh, directly from the midday sun when the sun hits the object from front and completely lights the, the, the face uh, of the person. Or you can also get it on a cloudy day when the whole scene is lit evenly. In the case of an overcast day where you have clouds, um, you have basically the clouds, they work as a natural soft box. So you don't have such a huge contrast uh, between shadowy and, um, and um, uh, shadows and lights and you have really low contrast light which is really really good to shoot for the beginners because when you don't have your camera basically measures uh, the the um, it measures automatically so you can use also the um, the um, mm, automatic mode <laughs> sometimes you just forget the words I think it's easiest to work with flat light on a cloudy day because you don't really have to worry about those really hard shadows on models light uh, on models face. So even if you don't uh, make your model look into the direction of the light source, which is the sun behind the clouds, the shadows will be probably there a little bit, but they will be not as distracting as if, if your model would be facing uh, like bright sun uh, or looking at you during the really bright sunny day. Um, in, 
yeah, so fa flat light is as it's not as dramatic as f f some other uh, types of light because um, there is not much contrast, light contrast. This is why if you're uh, shooting in this situations where you have a flat, flat light, uh, you should probably emphasize uh, the colors um, because then you go from the light contrast into the color contrast and this really makes the picture pop because we don't want boring pictures, do we? <laughs> well, fashion and beauty photographers, they use flat light a lot because as I've already mentioned a little bit before, uh, when the light is flat, that means that uh, the face is evenly lit, it, it hits the face uh, completely and fills up all these little hollows we have, all the pores, uh, there is no shadows from the nose, no shadows from your eyebrows, so it really, you don't really have to Photoshop, like I don't like editing my pictures in Photoshop anyway, I don't like editing blemishes, but of course sometimes I work with models of friends who, I don't know, have a pimple on the day of a shoot and in the flat light where the light hits directly in this way skin looks a little bit more flawless a little bit more flattering to to whoever you're photographing um, flat light is good for creating business portraits resume pictures uh, book covers because you're basically capturing a face of a person without distractions such as shadows that means also you don't really, you're not really creative with, uh, with the face, you're not really creative uh, when it comes to the light situation, everything looks as it is, um, without any play, without, so if you want to uh, be more creative, as I already mentioned, you accentuate the color, uh, colors of the environment and the colors of the person's outfit. So if you're traveling somewhere and it's a, sh it's a cloudy day, you don't really have a shadow play, you really should probably always travel with a few changes of clothes. If you want, for example, for your travel pictures or for your Instagram profile, uh, you always have to think of that kind of colors uh, which you're wearing in order for your pictures look a little bit more interesting even in the flat light where sometimes it just looks a little bit boring if it's all gray and uh, it because with flat light there's no contrast. Then let's go to uh, the reflected or bouncing light. I think I've already mentioned a little bit about the natural reflect uh, reflectors. Uh, so if you're shooting during midday, which we already talked about that it's one of the hardest time to photograph, sometimes you can of course make your model look uh, outdoors uh, towards the sun in profile, but you don't always want only profile pictures. So in this case, you can put a model, for example, inside of a building or in front of a building with a really light wall when so when a person is facing the light wall the sun is bouncing against the wall towards the face and in this way you have a really nicely lit situation in this picture here of my friend Marion who also had her um, also had her online workshop yesterday and I think you can still watch it online um, we were traveling together to Dubai and um, yeah, it was really hot and really bright outside, as you can see uh, from the windows. So we went into our hotel and there was this beautiful muddy colored walls. And you can see that she's having a little bit of a rim light also from the window coming from the back, uh, silhouetting her face. Plus you have uh, this, her, her face is actually lit a little bit by the reflecting lights from the walls which makes it really, really nice. And uh, you can see outside, it was bright light. It was probably during midday. The photos would not work that well. And in this case, we also have a little bit of environment around her. Plus, she is not dark. She is really lit. And it really, the walls worked as natural reflector. So um, with the reflected and bouncing light, you uh, have to face the model um, 
against the light of surface, as I said, and uh, you don't have always to place them against the white wall or the light wall. You can also get a little bit more creative, as in this case uh, with the picture of the right. This is also Murala Rocha, and this is my husband, Jan, which, uh, who doesn't like taking pictures and who is not a photographer. <laughs> and who also hates me taking pictures of him. But in this case, he actually agreed to pose a little bit. <laughs> and you can see that we were uh, photographing inside this corridor and the, f the walls were pink. And you can see this pink reflecting onto his face. In this case, it was a creative decision. I wanted it to be a little bit more uh, yeah, colorful and it can be distracting, so in this case it was a creative choice, but if you want to shoot somebody without that color distraction, it also depends on the color of the wall, because if it would be green, that green for example, or blue, it might not really be a really flattering light for a person to bounce on their face, so it all depends on your creative choice. Let's talk about open shade. So if you're shooting during a midday sun, as I've already mentioned, it's really hard to shoot, so you have to, uh, sh to find open shade. So open shade means here it's written open shadow because I obviously mistyped. Uh, open shade means that your subject is in a, sh uh, in a shadow facing the open sky. So it means that the right direct li light does not hit them, uh, but it bounces and reflects from, from the surrounding, air, uh, surrounding environment towards the person. So in this case, I was photographing um, teachers in different parts of Ukraine. Uh, and for this shoot, we f went to this school in the middle, somewhere in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and we all only had a really short time to shoot this um, amazing music teacher. And we went outside and it was bright sun, obviously not very flattering. I had to find a place for to, to actually uh, photograph her so we put her in the shadow under an apple tree and as you can see uh, in the back the scene is really overlit but at the same time uh, her face is also quite weight, uh, well lit because the surrounding light is reflecting onto her face without creating that kind of hard shadows which we talked about when you're shooting really in the direct, direct sun. So that's, uh, that's a good opportunity and a good um, trick for those who are probably shooting uh, somewhere near a tree. So you put the place a person next to a tree and this will be actually, you know, it will really save a shot. Um, spotlight. Well, um, usually limelight or spotlight uh, is a kind of light you use in a studio with projectors and with the, um, with the flashes. But you also can um, find natural spotlights in urban as well as in natural environments like uh, sun rays penetrate treetops or architectural elements or when sun is reflecting from glass or metal parts of the building. Um, you use, usually use spotlight to create a more dramatic look and make person the center of attention. This is why it's called spotlight or Hollywood light sometimes. In this picture on the left, as you can see, I went a little bit more dramatic with this spotlight because not complete face of my friend is, uh, is in the spotlight, but uh, there are some shadows on her face from the branches above, but I felt like in this case, I can really create a dramatic portrait. I often use this type of types of uh, light um, to surf uh, and this kind of like spotlights on surfaces to frame my models and because it illuminates their face and puts them really, really in focus. So here are the two pictures. One is of, uh, on the left is a friend of mine, Nadia. She's a photographer herself. And we were just uh, walking past a wall and there was a reflection from a building um, neck, uh, in front of us, which was reflecting onto the, uh, onto the 
banal wall. It was just a white wall, but because the wall was in a sh in a shadow and the light reflected onto her uh, onto the onto that particular spot, I just pl placed her there. And in this case, you can see it's very dramatic, and she's really in the focus of the picture. The viewer's attention goes directly to her face. And in the picture of the right, it's another picture uh, from my Teachers of Ukraine project where I really wanted to put this woman into the spotlight of a window light which was falling exactly on the space. You can see it looks very, very dramatic and very like putting her really on, uh, like really illuminating her while having the rest of the environment pretty dark. So this is really uh, a spontaneous, both pictures are spontaneous pictures because usually when you walk around and you don't have a studio in order to, to use lighting equipment to recreate that kind of lightning, uh, you, you need to, yeah, spontaneously while walking somewhere, you can just see a spotlight and just put a person you're photographing there, but you cannot really, um, uh, you can only replicate it in the studio if you really want deliberately to have a spotlight. Okay, let's go to the window light. Window light is not a specific situation, as I already mentioned, but it's more of a, yeah, a, a source of light, which can um, be used for different types of light, like side light, front light, and back light, depending on where, uh, where you stand and where your model stands. Uh, when you're shooting um, indoors, uh, often window is, of course, the only available source, and you can achieve different looks with the window light depending on the weather, time of the day, and position of, as I said, of the model or of your camera. Um, for example, here we had a rather uh, dull, uh, overcast day outside, but um, this musician, I was, I was shooting, like I placed him with, together with his lira. This is a traditional Ukrainian, very old type of an instrument, which he created himself. I really like the color, the turquoise color of that musical instrument and him standing there facing the light of the window with that colorful wall. It just really worked really, really well. So his hair like, hit, yeah, it's like a side light here because obviously window is only on the one side, but at the same time, as I've already talk, talked to you about the ref, uh, natural reflections, you can see that the white wall on his left side is reflecting onto his cheek. And so the contrast between the lit side and not lit side of his face is not as dramatic as not as strong. I really personally love using, um, uh, using windows as light sources because they create that natural dramatic look, even in indoor portrait photography. For example, uh, yeah, both of the pictures here, I've also used uh, really, um, well, contrasting colors. I, um, both of them are shot in a different types of light outside. Um, on, the, on the right, it was really sunny outside. On the left, it was really overcast. But um, yeah, both of the pictures really work well and you can achieve a lot of different looks with the window light. Here are another uh, pictures which I shot uh, with using of in the situation where the window was the only light. As you can see in the picture of the left, which is again my husband Jan, um, we were just sitting in a cafe, so it's not that we really planned that shoot, uh, but then I really love the color contrast between his um, sweater and the, uh, the wall of the cafe. And the fact that he is actually looking towards the window, uh, that was already my direction for him, because as you can see in this way, he is actually facing the light, so there's no strong shadows and um, yeah, his whole face is really well lit. In the case on the right, we have a sunny day, so you can see, of course, there's a lot of uh, overlit elements, but generally the same um, principle applies. Uh, so the model is looking towards the window, so that actually she doesn't have that kind of split light situation because if she would be facing the camera then of course her side which is facing the window would be overlit and then the 
other part of a face would be in shadow. In this case, we didn't want that. This is why we chose the um, side light situation. Uh, here's another um, example of uh, a window used as a source also shot during the golden hour in the morning, which I usually don't do very often. <laughs> I don't really wake up early. So if I'm talking about golden hour, for me, it's always evening because in the morning I prefer to sleep. But here we had an opportunity to use the window as the light. And I think uh, for me personally, this picture is really inspired by my favorite uh, American realist painter, Edward Hopper. He has a very, well, he doesn't have a very similar picture, but he has a uh, picture called Morning Light, where a woman is similarly sitting on a bed facing a, light, um, facing a window. And when I shot this picture, I immediately saw the reference to that, to that painting of him. Okay, we are uh, nearing the end, so let's talk shortly about available and street light. Um, if you're shooting do you, uh, already after dark, um, of course, there you can always shoot a fl with a flash, which I never do. I don't even own a flash. <laughs> but uh, even if you are in, uh, if you're working in a city in an urban environment, there's always an opportunity to. Um, use available street lights uh, for the purpose of lighting person's face when you're doing a portrait. Sometimes street lamps uh, and artificial light sources, they can even help you to create a certain look and set a special mood. Like in this case, we were on a top of a building in Kiev, Ukraine, and there were red lights spotlights on the bottom of the building because I think it was a helipad so for helicopters to land they had the red lights in this case I uh, asked the model to look towards the light on the bottom this way his face is dramatically lit from from below and it creates this kind of really gloomy and uh, mysterious dramatic look here are another examples of using available and street lights. Um, it, on the left, it's inside a hotel, so it's an available light. In a, uh, it's really greenish. Green is not always the best light for portrait photography because, uh, yeah, the face looks... Yeah, well, green is probably not the natural color of a face, but at the same time, for uh, artistic purposes, uh, if you're doing creative, uh, creative photography, um, yeah, you can use any kind of uh, artificial light in order to yeah, set the mood. On the right, it, it's, the light is rather dramatic. I shot this couple in Japan, in Tokyo. It was a very cool shoot. Uh, it was really fun to, do, to work with them because they both didn't speak any English or German. We communicated through uh, Google Translate. At the same time, they were so natural in what they were doing. Um, the guy was an actor and the girl is a dancer, contemporary dancer, and they were not even friends, but they both created, there was such a nice connection between, between us in this picture. So I really wanted that kind of dramatic look of people standing together but not really being together so this artificial light from just a street lamp really added to the scene plus of course the people who are just walking by it makes the scene even more cinematic than it already is <laughs> so the problem with street lights of course is that they're not usually very bright so we speak of a rather poor lighting situation and if you're shooting a street light, a uh, street portrait in the dark, you typ typically need a uh, more open aperture and also a higher ISO in order for uh, the pictures to, to be lit properly and also to avoid the... You, use the, the uh, you do a higher ISO in order to avoid the shakiness when you're using a longer shutter speed. And uh, yeah, of course, you can also use a tripod to avoid, uh, to avoid this kind of motion blur and shaky images. 
I usually never use tripod during my travels or during my shoots. It's just too much work for me. And I also am a very spontaneous shooter, even if I'm shooting um, a planned commercial shoot. Uh, I'm spontaneous in a way that I'm still trying to find the light which will work best and where I don't have to use the tripod. So if I'm on the street, I will still try to find the brightest spot and make the model look towards the light so we can still have this lit face and uh, not really go um, low with the shutter, um, really low in the shutter speed. I usually never go above ISO 1600 with my shots, although the new Nikon cameras as well as other camera brands, they can reach really high ISO values without losing detail, but usually if, especially if you're shooting with some older models or maybe uh, with uh, the lenses which uh, don't open, which don't have such an open aperture, um, usually if you go with an ISO, uh, with their, you, you, you get a lot of digital noise and it's just distracting and it's just basically an artifact and a mistake and it doesn't look good. So sometimes it's better not to shoot a picture than to shoot a bad picture. So I also recommend not to shoot uh, at pitch black. As I already said, if you want to shoot a night picture with artificial lights outside, probably do it during the dusk when the street lights are already on, but the uh, sky is still not pitch black. So there is some help uh, for you from the sky actually, because when it's dark outside, then you don't, you only have the artificial light and it's not always that strong. All right, well, I'm coming uh, to the end of my presentation. So thank you very much. Um, and I don't know if we have any questions. Uh, I think I was pretty um, detailed in everything I told you today. I really think, uh, I really hope it was helpful for some of you. I don't know how many professionals are watching me or how many beginning photographers are watching me. But um, yeah, like I think learning about natural light and how to use it is very, very important. And it's even more important uh, if you are planning to go into studio photography later, because when you learn how to use natural light situations where you learn how to use the sun, then it's so much easier to replicate that kind of light situations in the studio with the available light you have. And if you uh, want to follow me on Instagram, it's uh, my surname with three R's, Rudia, so I sound very Spanish. And please um, send me your feedback onto this online workshop. Also, if you participated in Female Photo Days, our photo walks, you can also send me your feedback and pictures you've shot to this Instagram uh, handle. Also, you can write me an email at alinarudia at wherever me. And of course, you can visit my website, especially if you're a huge company, you wanna work with me, alinarudia.com for your, you know, for your consideration. And um, of course, uh, join Bell Collective. If you're a female creator, female photographer, our Instagram is Bell Collective and email is uh, info at bellcollective.com. You can also visit our website. There are some news coming up soon on our website. Uh, we're launching a new website soon. Um, if you're a female creator, I would be really, really happy to, for you to use our hashtag, which is Balcall, and for you to tag your pictures with our handle so I can share more of the beautiful female photography on our channel. And I hope we can really break those stereotypes about uh, female creative choices together. And I want to basically wrap up our female photo days today. Uh, I again uh, am grateful to everyone who came, all the lecturers, all the photographers who gave their workshops and photo walks uh, these two days. I want to, th to thank every uh, woman, uh, every photographer who sent her pictures to our uh, woman with a camera photo contest. Uh, we were really, really happy to see so many amazing images with such amazing and inspiring captions. 
uh, in our exhibition. So we, I also would love to thank again our partner Nikon for supporting what we're doing, for supporting Female Photo Days and all our sponsors uh, who supported what we're doing. We really hope to work with you in the future and we really hope for you to support us also next time we're organizing Female Photo Days. Uh, I think we have to, this kind of role modeling, uh, which we saw in the, in the past few days, uh, we saw really, really a lot of inspired women, a lot of inspiring uh, women who inspired others. And it was really, really great for me personally uh, to, to see how women are empowering other women and how they're supporting each other. And I really hope that uh, we can be an example and a role model for future generations of female photographers to come. Thank you very much. And I really hope you have a great weekend. Uh, follow us on Bell Collective, share your impressions, share your comments, and thank you very much, and bye-bye.